I'm a desk assistant for my university, and basically all I do is rent out vacuums, give spare keys to rooms, and answer questions. I have a super late night shift on Saturdays from 8 to midnight, and I live on the other side of campus. The buses also don't run that late, so I have to walk home. For some reason, when I was closing the desk, I got a gross feeling. Like a pit in my stomach as if something bad was about to happen. I of course shrugged it off because I needed to get home. This feeling definitely didn't go away when I walked by a group of guys outside the building who were saying some gross things. Not to me, just generally. But one guy was staring me down, and this was enough to make my anxiety spike. I am a girl, and I'm only about 5 foot 3. I walked away quickly so they couldn't trail me, and as I walked, I listened and checked behind me the whole way home. However, I got to this dark patch of forest between Central and South Campus. It wasn't super dark. You could see the other buildings through the trees, but it was still a bit scary this late at night. I debated taking one of two paths. One was kind of longer, but would get me to a well-lit area faster. And the other was in total darkness, but I'd get home faster. As I was walking up to where I would have to choose a path, I saw a light bouncing on the longer path in the distance. I assumed it was a biker with a headlight. Mind you, this is a college campus, it's not uncommon to see students out this late. Because I felt like it was a person, I decided to take that path. But the bouncing light wasn't actually moving towards me like a biker would be. Instead, it was just bouncing around on one part of the path. And once I got close, it suddenly bounced off the path and disappeared over the small hill that surrounded it. I didn't feel scared though. I actually felt kind of at ease when I saw it. When I got home, I texted my mom about it. And that's when she reminded me that my great-grandmother would see light similar to what I saw. It started when she was around my age too and she was actually scared of them. Until she realized that they never harmed her. If anything, they would actually guide her. There were a lot of times they would save her from seeing something, or I remember my mom telling me of one instance where they actually led her to a hidden can of money. So, I don't know. Maybe they knew about the past debate I had in my head and knew I'd pick the path that seemingly had a person on it. Either way, I made it home safe that night. This story is 100% true, and honestly the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. At the age of 15, I moved to Southwest Houston. I had moved around for many years, primarily due to being in foster care and not really having a strong support system or family. Houston itself is somewhat nice, but naturally, I had to be placed in a home in probably one of the most ghetto parts of the city. I was honestly one of the only Caucasian people in my area, which made it somewhat difficult to make friends due to cultural differences and so on. I met a guy named David who had a girlfriend at the time. We soon became very close and he became very flirtatious and somewhat protective over me. I also noticed he was deeply involved with drugs and had some major anger issues. I didn't realize how truly mentally unstable he was until after hanging around him and his girlfriend for a few months. One day, we skipped school and went to the nearest skate park. Naturally, as young burnouts, we just lounged around, smoked weed, spray painted, and kept busting our asses on the ramps at the park. After about 30 minutes, we were approached by several guys wearing fully black clothing. I recognized a couple of them from my biology class. Next thing I knew, they began to attack David. He was thrown onto the ground, being kicked and punched repeatedly. I did my best to try and pry them off of David, but that only ended in me receiving several blows to the stomach and several other areas of my body, until I could barely get up. 
That day, we both ended up in the emergency room. David told me not to breathe a word to anyone about what happened, which only created more problems for me, but I listened, because for some odd reason, I trusted him. A week later, David found me in the hallway early in the morning before first period. He pulled me to the side and looked around anxiously, his eyes darting back and forth between different parts of the hallway. What's going on? I asked, completely thrown off by his sudden erratic behavior. Those guys are going to pay for what they did to us, he whispered softly. What do you mean? I said nervously. I have a gun. Miranda has one too. I'm going to take care of those fuckers today. Go home. He said it through gritted teeth, reaching into his backpack and slowly revealing a black handgun. I quickly placed my hand on his, pushing his hand further down to the backpack. David, don't let anyone see that, I whispered quickly. My heart was pounding, my head was spinning, and I felt a deep pit in my stomach. My mind raced 90 miles an hour. What the fuck was wrong with him? Why did his girlfriend Miranda have a gun? What the fuck do I do? I don't want you to get hurt. I need to protect you. Both of you. I trust you, and I know you won't tell anyone, he said quietly, his eyes softening. My thoughts continued to race, and I did the one thing I thought I could, to get away from him and tell someone immediately. All right, whatever you're going to do, just wait. Let me get my foster sisters out first, okay? He nodded, and surprisingly, he let me go. I raced down two flights of stairs across the school and finally made it to the principal's office. I opened the door without even knocking, which did piss our principal off, but I cut him off before he could say anything and said David F. and Miranda H. both have handguns. They both brought guns into the school. A few minutes later, the school was put into lockdown and my only two friends I had that entire school year were arrested. There were news reports, officers questioned me, and as you can imagine, I was grounded for quite a while for my choice of friends. I later decided to move away from that area because I wasn't sure what would happen to me if they somehow got out while I was still living there. I don't know if they really planned to use the guns on campus. I just know that I was fucking scared. For me, for the other students, for the faculty, all I know is that maybe I saved someone's life that day, and I don't regret it. I've been following these paranormal subs for a while and would like to share my own experiences. October of 2010, I was 20. I had reconnected with my biological father after not seeing him since I was three. He was addicted to intravenous crystal meth for most of my childhood. I will also get out of the way that he is gay only because his former partner who lived with us during these events is relevant to the story. How was I conceived, you ask? There is still some debate to that, which isn't relevant here. Anyway, when I first moved in, man, it was great to have a real dad. My stepdad was an abusive piece of shit, so I was on top of the world even though the situation was far from perfect. We'd listen to records, talk for hours over drinks and cigarettes. I told him all about my life and learned about his, his siblings, his parents, our family's history. We spent that summer in record stores, dive bars, and walking Fremont Street, where most Vegas locals go. Not the Strip, by the way. Did I mention this is Las Vegas? Not the first place you think of when you think of paranormal phenomena, haunting, and possession, am I right? But it's all here. I think we were ripe for attracting some kind of negative energy or entity to us, because along with those good times came a lot of struggles. I was having an existential dilemma. I had decided God and gods didn't exist that I didn't want to be a practicing pagan anymore. I didn't believe in anything anymore. At the time, my psyche was getting kind of dark the longer I was there. I was lonely. It was hot. My job was hard. My dad's former partner, let's call him Gus, who was still living with us, was a severe alcoholic and absolutely heartbroken that my dad wanted out of their 16-year-long relationship. To be honest, it made me sad too. 
This also strained them financially because prior to this alcoholism, Gus was more the breadwinner and better at managing finances. My dad, for some reason, just can't pay and manage bills. So lights and gas were constantly being shut off. Their vehicles were repossessed. Their life together was just disintegrating in every way. I think Gus hoped that by me coming out there, it might bring them back together. When it was clear that wasn't the case, it all got worse. We were never home that summer because we had no central air. We also had a bad cockroach infestation that my dad constantly said he was getting an exterminator for, but never did. For whatever reason, mainly boredom, I was watching really disturbing horror films, like Martyrs and a Serbian film. I was watching weird porn. I was exploring the tenets of Satanism and watching documentaries on Aleister Crowley and the occult. I didn't practice anything occult in that house, but I was consuming a lot of dark shit. The first experience I had with the supernatural was on an especially hot day, and I acknowledge this may have been some kind of heat-induced hallucination because I am a rational person. I was trying not to move a muscle because I was so hot. It was midsummer with no central air or AC, and I was in a recliner in the living room, which provides a view of the hallway. I saw a black, shadowy figure emerge from a closed closet door in the hallway, and move down the hallway where it disappeared towards the end of the hall, where my room and my dad's room were on the other side. Moments later, I saw my dad, or so I thought, quickly walk into the bedroom from his room, which was right across the hall. But seconds later, he walked in from the backyard. This is where the laws of physics seemed to bend in our home, or I was seeing something impersonating my dad. There was a gigantic, ancient, rusted swamp cooler covering my window, and he's six foot five and 250 pounds. There is no way to get from my bedroom to our backyard. Still, I had to tell him. I just saw you walk into my room. He said, why would I be in your room? I've been in the backyard, but you're not the first person to see that. He went on to tell me that guests who have stayed with them have been spooked by talking to someone, usually over their shoulder or just out of view, who they believe is my dad, only to discover he was nowhere nearby. I dismissed this like I said, he'd induced hysteria. It's Nevada. It's hot. People see things out of the corner of their eye that aren't there. Case closed. There were a few other little incidents, old-timey music that sounded like it was from a phonograph in the living room with no discernible origin, the constant feeling of being watched, especially in my room at night. It would keep me awake, and when I would start to drift off, I would hear a scream in my ear that jolted me up. But it really went to hell on Halloween night. I was working at a discount clothing store for a franchise in which my dad was also a manager. He had gotten me the job, but worked at another location. He was off sooner and waiting for me to get home so we could go out with some of his friends. When I walked in our front door, he was sitting at our desktop computer quietly in our dining area. He didn't look ready to go out or acknowledge me, but I didn't think much of it. It was 11 p.m. and I'd seen my dad head out to the bars at 4 a.m. Most are 24 hours, and if they do close early, there's a casino bars which are open 24 seven. I stayed in my work uniform, since there didn't seem to be a rush, went out to the back porch, which was our designated smoking area. I really wish I had gotten a chance to finish a hit of some weed before the events unfolded that night. I had just started to break up the weed when I saw a potted house plant fly through the open sliding glass door to the back porch. Now this was odd. My dad, out of the two of my parents, was the non-violent one. He was the one attacked by my mother in his youth. He has never so much as raised his voice to me. In fact, I had yelled at him once since being there, and he just laughed. He was easygoing and fun. In fact, he was a blast. But I hear shattering and breaking. Inside, he had thrown a thick glass plate at the wall in the living room, and it had stuck there. He was throwing plates and anything he could grab out of the open sliding glass door. He came outside and seemed to be in a kind of trance. He picked up one of our tall candles, the kind that are in glass like a Santa Maria or Jesus candle, 
and smashed it into the glass top table we had back there where I was sitting. I jumped up as he smashed. He grabbed our huge, thick ashtray and hurled it at our grill, cracking the super thick handle of the lid on the dome of it. I grew up around this kind of destruction as well as violence with my mom and stepdad, so I was strangely calm as I gathered his two small dogs, went inside, and slid the glass door shut. His eyes were only half open, and he didn't make a sound as he wrecked things. The other side where he was had these vertical blinds, and he ripped them down. It created this bizarre effect like Gus and I were viewing a creature in an enclosure who had once been someone we knew. He had cut his hand at one point and was smearing the blood up his arms and across his face. This is really bizarre because he faints at the sight of blood. I don't know how he used to manage to shoot up drugs, but in the time since he was nine years clean, he had developed a huge blood phobia. But he then began to trace symbols in the blood on the glass. Gus got close to the glass, stunned at what he was seeing and just staring incredulously. My dad's eyes opened wide at him, glaring with a boiling hate, and he pointed at him and pointed in an I'm going to get you way. It was frightening and so strange. I had never seen so much hate in a person's eyes. They had not been arguing prior to this that day. Even when there were struggles that year, they rarely fought. This was just odd. At one point, my dad stopped glaring and pointing at Gus and went to go sit down at the smashed table. He lit a cigarette, the blood staining the filter. I carefully went back outside and sat down. There was ruin everywhere. Broken glass, clumps of dirt, plastic paper, and blood. I asked if he was okay. No answer. I asked if I could clean him up. No answer, but he pulled away when I tried to wipe the blood up. He eventually got up and cleaned himself in the bathroom, leaving bloody handprints on the way in the hall. I called a friend of his who came to check in on him. He barely noticed she was there. After she left, he blinked and looked around at some point and asked what happened. He did not believe that he caused all of the destruction he saw. The first thing he noticed was the completely cracked handle of the grill dome. It's really thick as fuck, and he was pissed at first, who broke that, only to find out it was him. I think we must have cleaned up after that, because I remember it was suddenly 4am and we realized we had never eaten dinner and we were starving. He seemed to be more or less okay, so we went to a burger spot close by and got some food. Before we left, I distinctly remember him pulling out the plate that he had thrown, which stuck in the wall. It had gone stuck really high up, and only he would have been able to reach it. We returned with our food about 20 minutes later. The mess we had cleaned up was back, including the plate, which was stuck in the wall. My 42-year-old, 6'5 father burst into tears and shrunk back, turning to me in terror, saying, What do we do, Nicole? Asking me. The faithless ex-pagan. I had no idea what to say. The next day, safe to say the vibe was fucking weird. My dad claimed he still had no memory of his destructive behavior, but he did recall getting some bad news prior and blamed it on that. The child of one of his friends we were going to go meet up with that night was in the hospital. I just didn't buy it, even in my existential, skeptical, and faithless state. When my dad had been tracing what looked like symbols on the glass, I had wished so much that I had any faith that I had a Bible to hold out in front of me. Which is very strange because I spent a lot of energy and time online bashing Christians and even Jesus himself. I had joined a Facebook group called Fuck Jesus Christ at one point around that time. Like, it was like that. So yeah, that was the explanation he gave me. Stress and a sick kid that he barely knew. But the energy was still so heavy, and he still seemed to be in a trance-like state even though he said everything was fine. He also was taking my pipe of weed and smoking it inside. He never smoked weed, and I wasn't allowed to smoke inside. Maybe he ended up smoking all of it, because during my next experience, I remember I was completely sober. That is a very important fact. I want it to be known that when I did see entities, I was sober, with no drugs or alcohol in my system and that I'm not prone to hallucinations. 
So, I was on the same back porch area when the next incident occurred. I had just walked out and stood there lighting up a cigarette. As I focused on the flame, I noticed what I thought was someone standing just on the outside of the porch. I could make a solid, dark shape of shoulders, arms, and a torso. My eyes began to focus from the flame onto the figure, and that's when I swear my heart fucking stopped for a minute. I am amazed I didn't shit my pants. The figure was humanoid and only partially there. This next part is very difficult for me to describe, and I always struggle with it. There were sections of this being that were there, as in solid and existing in space, and there were other sections that simply put were not. The sections that were missing were where the darkness fell onto it. Where shafts of light were, so too was this creature. This included most of the shoulders, arms, and torso. The light of the porch fell across it in a diagonal across the chest. It's really hard to explain, but where its head should have been and the rest of its upper body outside of the light, I could see the tree and our fence behind it. It's like it only existed in the light. In that light, it had skin. It was not just a black shadow, but it did not have human skin. It was mottled kind of blue-black, and immediately reminded me of a pattern you'd see on salamanders slash water amphibians. It was even shiny and wet looking. This was not just an image of an entity visible in a light because its ribs were moving with each breath. It was breathing. It takes many words to describe what I saw in that instant. It did not disappear as I jumped, screamed, and panicked. I didn't move. I was not sure if it could see me, but we definitely were facing each other completely. If it was capable of seeing me in whatever trans-dimensional state that was, then it did. My dad's dogs were at the other end of the yard. I wanted them inside as quickly as possible and called them to me. I got them inside, slammed the sliding glass door shut with that thing still out there. I scooped a dog under each arm and ran into my room, flipped the lights on, and dove under the covers. I stayed there with them for the rest of the night. My dad did not want to hear about what I saw. The next day when I approached him, I tried to tell him about what I had been seeing. First the shadow and then an entity that seemed to be crossing over in our dimension and growing strength. He said to me, this is his house. I was stunned. Who is him? Who is he? This is our house. This is your house. You can't just give up that easily. We need an exorcism for the house and maybe for you. He said he didn't want to talk about it anymore. That talking about it was going to make it worse. I barely knew anyone in Vegas, let alone any spiritual people who could help me. I didn't know where to turn even if there were witches, priests, shamans, so the entity stayed. I never saw it again, but my dad's behavior became crueler, more erratic, and eventually criminal. Meanwhile, Gus was suffering the most out of all of us. Gus was towards the end of his long battle with alcoholism, and the alcohol was winning. He also seemed to be targeted by whatever this thing was. There were noises that only he seemed to hear, chopping in the kitchen with a knife when no one was in there. Voices in the bathroom, telling him bad things about himself. Many times I walked out into that cursed fucking back porch to find him sitting alone in the dark. Why are you sitting here in the dark? I would say. I'm just listening, he would reply. He would get better, and then he would get worse. Much worse. The bug infestation also got worse and worse, biting me in my sleep, growing bigger. It all got to be too much. By the following summer, my dad met another man, a much younger one, and it became serious very quickly. He was ready for us to move out and live with this guy. At one point, when I was not present, my dad knocked Gus down, jumped onto him, and punched him in the face multiple times. His new boyfriend witnessed this and was unfazed. I was at work and came home horrified. No one held him accountable, talked about calling the police, or taking Gus to the hospital. But he never, in nearly 20 years of knowing him, ever laid a hand on Gus. The day after that first blackout on Halloween, I called my dad's siblings and asked if he had a history of blackouts and violence. They all said the same thing. Never. 
not even at the height of his addiction. But this was a new and terrifying version of my dad. In March of 2012, Gus died of alcohol poisoning, alone in the house after we moved out. Something for which I had immense guilt of for a long time. We tried to get him help several times. There are many ER visits and rehab attempts, but eventually, we just gave up with getting him sober. My dad and his boyfriend had checked on him before going camping. Gus had called me saying his stomach hurt. I was several towns away and I couldn't get to him. I don't drive, couldn't afford a taxi, and Ubers didn't exist yet. I told him to please call 911. I then told my dad he wasn't feeling well. They did rush back, but it was too late. They found him in the hallway in front of the closet where that first shadow figure manifested. I should have sent an ambulance to the house when he said his stomach hurt and he couldn't eat, and I will forever carry that with me. The night we packed up his most prized possessions right after his death, my dad got drunk on what was left of his whiskey. I ended up screaming at me in a fast food parking lot and throttling my neck and shoulders when I yelled back. The fight continued when we got to our new home that night, with him running at full speed to attack me and me slamming my door shut and locking it just in time. He slammed into it hard and I shudder to think what would have happened if I hadn't acted so quickly. Again, his new boyfriend rationalized and minimized his behavior. He was being abused himself, having been headbutted, punched, belittled, and insulted multiple times by my dad. His boyfriend never turned him in. He just was stood to prove his loyalty. Nearly 10 years later, they are still together. His boyfriend also states he has always known that my dad had a demon in him. When he would become violent, his boyfriend and I would again point out that he had this entity attached to him, influencing his behavior. It would make him angrier every time we mentioned it. There is no demon, he would yell. He got into fights with friends as well, having blackout rages in public. How he avoided arrest, I'm not sure, but he was temperamental and damaged property. He didn't get along with his boyfriend's roommate. It wasn't long before we moved again. When we did, and we were in the backyard of yet another new house sometime later, standing behind my dad was yet another dark shadow figure, this time in the middle of the day, out in the afternoon sunshine. He looked behind him, but he didn't see it. He was so mad at me when I saw it there, and sat there frozen before trying to tell him what I saw. Of course, since what I saw was demonic in nature, he got angry. Around this time, he was arrested. Not for his violence, but for embezzling thousands from that discount retail place we both worked for at one point. Again, his boyfriend rose to the occasion to prove his loyalty maxing out his credit card to bail him out, and supporting him after the arrest zapped his employment opportunities. I also was helping to pay his rent on their new home in spite of continuing to endure verbal abuse from him. Not long after this, his boyfriend asked me to move out. After I left, my dad's health started to deteriorate, nerve pain in his arms and legs, seizures, brain cyst. A car accident on Christmas Eve that nearly killed them both, led to chronic back pain from my dad. He had continued to be very verbally abusive and it has only gotten worse in recent years. My final straw was after him calling me a whore for being single and getting pregnant. Not being there for me my entire pregnancy, him attacking me and calling me and my mother horrible names, then disowning me while I had my first child and was fresh out of surgery in the hospital. He made my blood pressure skyrocket like his bullshit literally almost killed me. I have not spoken to him since shortly after my daughter was born, and she is 15 months old now. My dad hasn't worked in years. He is just slowly getting older and more miserable and unhealthy. I feel bad for his boyfriend. I really wish we could have gotten him some real spiritual help. He claims he accepted a blessed medallion from a Catholic priest and that it helped some of the frightening hallucinations he had for a long time but the damage is done to his body, mind, and soul. I feel, I know in my bones, that the entity is still in him. I do have some theories as to why it may have targeted him as it did. His mother was a witch, and she practiced curses and hexes which harmed people. He was her favorite son. 
I don't find that to be a coincidence. I'm still a rational person, but I do believe in God, angels, and demons now. I know something had my back in that house even as I rejected all things godly. And I know something invaded my father and changed him. Not all possessions are like they are in the movies. I guess they can live inside of a person for a long time, just slowly draining them of life and causing pain to those unlucky enough to be around. 